Power is certainly related to energy or work, but it has a very specific meaning. Power is equal to the work done over the time. There's nothing wrong with you saying power is equal to the change in energy of the system over the time. Both of those ideas are equivalent because work is equal to change in energy. Um, it can be a little confusing because the formula on your formula sheet is given as power equals work over time. The only problem with that is you have the letter W which appears in the formula and that W stands for a quantity called work that has units of joules, but the quantity in that formula of power has units of watts, which is abbreviated as W. So one way or another, you have to maneuver your way around that discrepancy or understand that basically the letter W can mean a number of different things. It can mean Wolfram in chemistry or tungsten. The other thing that you need to be able to work with is a percent efficiency in terms of power or energy. And basically, I'll just write this as useful, useful over total multiplied by 100. You can use joules over joules times 100 to get the percent. You can use watts over watts. You can use horsepower over horsepower. And the other thing is for some of these questions, particularly I think the textbook questions, if you went that way, you need to know that one horsepower is approximately 746 watts of power or joules per second. That's a piece of information that would definitely be given to you on an exam. Does anybody have any questions that you'd like me to go over? Aoki. Number two. So you lift a 1.2 kilogram batch of French fries out of the deep fat fryer to a height of 50 centimeters and it takes you two seconds. What's the power output? Well, in this particular case, I would prefer to use this idea. I will do it again using the idea of work in a second. But if I talk about energy, and uh, I was a little lazy there, maybe I shouldn't be so lazy. I really should be writing power equals change in energy over time, right? It's not just energy, it's change in energy. Well, what kind of energy do the French fries undergo a change in? Gravitational potential energy. And gravitational potential energy can be found using MGH. And if we calculate MGH, what we will be finding here, and you see it already, but what we will be finding is the gravitational potential energy that the French fries have at the end of my action, at the end of me doing something. And since we're going to use 50 centimeters here, let me put in the numbers. It's 1.2 times G times 0 0.5. We all know what G is. I'm not going to write it down, 9.81 newtons per kilogram. If I figure out what this is, I believe I'm going to get, and, and I'm going to want your help here, very close to 6 joules. Be a little bit less than 6 joules, 5 point something. Okay? But the bottom line is, I'm just in teaching mode here. We don't have to worry about exact numbers. You have them on your calculator. Now what I can do is I can take that approximately 6 joules and divide by 2 seconds, and I'm going to get very close to 3 watts. Apparently, I'm going to get 2.9 joules per second. Does that do it for you? That's good? Okay, now, you know, I didn't have to use that approach, although I prefer that approach for this question. I understand with not as much experience, you might not know which approach to take. So what if you took this approach, where the power is equal to the work that you did, not the energy change of the French fries, but the work that you did 
in lifting the fries up to that level. Well, here is the basket of fries. And you are going to lift that basket of fries up from what we're going to call this height of being zero. And you're going to apply a force to them to move them up. And you're moving them up a displacement of 0.5 meters. Well, work is force times distance. So we get power equals force times distance over time. What is the force that's required to lift those fries? Well, there's already a force of gravity acting down on the fries. And if I want to lift them, then I have to apply an equal force in the opposite direction. Now, let me label these forces. This is the force due to gravity. This is the applied force, which is what we would put here in this formula. This is F applied. And we've talked about this little bit of business before. That applied force is exactly equal to the force of gravity because we're interested in the change in potential energy of the fries. We're not accelerating the fries. We're just moving them at a nice, steady, constant rate. And since the applied force, looking at our free body diagram, is the gravitational force's value, it's the same magnitude, then I can put in here m times g for the applied force times d over t. I hope you see that that's going to give you the same result as thinking about energy, because when you think about energy, this was mgh. I, I want to just pause here for a second. I, I, I think I mentioned it, but maybe I didn't. When we calculate mgh at the top, that's the energy at the top. Why is that energy at the top equal to the change in energy? Because it had no energy at the bottom. Okay. Anyway, is that okay? All right. Other questions? Yeah. Four? So we have a vehicle. It's a Mustang. Gives you the year number, the number of cylinders, it's a V6. It has a mass of 1,600 kilograms, and it's rated at 320 horsepower. And the car can accelerate from 0 to 100 in 5.92 seconds. What's the percent efficiency in accelerating? So let's get this out of the way first. 320 horsepower. I would prefer to work in watts. I mean, we could work exclusively in horsepower, but horsepower is a non-standard unit, so let's work in standard units. I suspect most of you know that to find out the number of watts would involve multiplying these two numbers. Because it's 320 horsepower and it's 746 horsepower per, sorry, 746 watts per horsepower. If you want, you could set up a ratio. You could say one horse, horsepower is 746 watts. That has to be equal to a constant ratio of 320 horsepower over x watts. And you can see that you have to cross multiply there, which would result in multiplying the 746 and the 320. Two hundred thirty-eight thousand seven hundred and twenty. And I'm just going to pause there and say that in terms of percent efficiency, this is the total power. So when the person accelerates the Mustang from zero to one hundred kilometers per hour in that time interval, not the entire two hundred thirty-eight. 720 joules per second is being used. It's being used, but not to accelerate the car. Some of it is being used to make noise. Some of it is being used to produce a lot of heat. But that's the total power. So back here when I said percent efficiency is that, that's the number that would go on the bottom. Now, in terms of useful power, you can call it power output if you want. But in terms of useful power, 
the useful power is the power that is used to do work to accelerate the car. I mean, if you own a Mustang, you might think part of the useful power is to make that rumbling noise, but that amount of energy per second is pretty small anyway. In other words, when you look at power equals change in energy over time, this is tricky. You understand that formula I just wrote is not on your formula sheet. P equals W over T is, but I like this formula. What I am finding here is the useful power. I have the total power. I want to find the useful power. Well, what kind of energy change does the car undergo? It's kinetic. So this is going to be 1 half mv squared minus 1 half mv squared. And this will be over the time. So I'm not talking about percent efficiency yet. I'm just figuring out what's the useful power usage here. And I hope that you can appreciate that this is not important because it starts from rest. This. What is VF? We have to do a little calculation here. It's 100 kilometers per hour. Can everybody please convert that to meters per second? I get 27.7 repeating meters per second. So now what I need to do to find this useful power is take 1 half times the mass. I think it was 1,600 kilograms. By the way, don't quote me on that mass. I don't know if I actually researched the mass of a Mustang, a 2015 Mustang or not. Seems like it might be about right. Times that 27.7 meters per second. Carry all your decimals. Quantity squared minus nothing. Minus nothing because it starts from rest. This is over the time of 5.92 seconds. So to the calculator. 0. 0.5 times 1,600 times the 27.7 repeating squared. And then I have to divide by 5.92. Double check my entries. They look OK. So the useful power in this situation from the car, in terms of providing motion of the car, that's what cars are used for. They're used to move. They're not used to create heat, although that's a byproduct of it. That useful power. is 104,271 watts. Um, I, I don't know what I wrote up here. I wrote watts, so I'll be consistent. Remember that W does not stand for work. It stands for watts or joules per second. So if I scroll up and look at the useful power compared to the total, it was a, about 240,000 of total power this is less than half, but not a lot less than half. You just need to find out what percent it is now. And I forget who had asked about this question. Zahara, thank you. So the percent efficiency is useful over total. I think I already wrote this someplace, but times 100. The useful. is the 102, 104 rather, 271 joules per second. I'll switch to this way of writing it. Over 238,720. 
joules per second. I mean, if you're not bad with numbers, I, I think you can see that it's going to be somewhere between about 40 and 50 percent. But apparently when you do that, you're going to get 40. Uh, that cannot be the correct answer. Does yours say 43.7? Yours says 4.37. It should say 43.7. So that's a typing mistake. I'm just going to make a note to fix that in my notes for next time. That's number four. Uh, do you get 43.7, though? Is it just a matter of the decimal? Okay. Is that okay? Were you asking because you were getting 43.7? I apologize. It was a good exercise to go through and do the question anyway. Did you have a question, Nate? Number three? Okay. 65 kilogram athlete runs at a constant velocity. So I want to pause there. There's a subtlety to this question. If the athlete is running at a constant velocity, then the work they are doing is not going into kinetic energy. Because if the work they were doing went into kinetic energy, they would be accelerating. They would be going faster and faster. So where is their work going? If they were running at a constant velocity along a horizontal surface, all their work would be lost to heat. Every last joule of work would be producing heat. Sweat in terms of heat, friction in terms of heat, frictional forces producing heat, rather. But they're running up an incline, and what that means, I don't know if that's 25 degrees. I'm not going to worry about it. What that means is, and I'm not going to draw a jogger, they are here and then they are here, They've done work to accomplish that, but they haven't gained kinetic energy. What kind of energy did they gain, Nate? Well, it would be gravitational potential energy. So when you start talking about power, which is change in energy over time, that means the power output of the student or the power output is not really a necessary word here. We're talking about total power of the student, the power that the student provides. So when we go back and look at that Mustang question, that power, that total power is sometimes called the power output. But only a small part of it is useful. Um, this will be MGH over T. Um, maybe I should be very specific here. What this is, is actually the change in MGH over T. All right? But we can always assign where the student started to be zero. Always. Now, what are we asked here? How long does it take the athlete to run a total of 20 meters along the incline? Oh, we're actually told the power. This is a bit of a tricky question. I'm going to put the power in. It's kilowatts, so it's 1,900. And I'm going to put joules per second. We know what the mass is. I think it was 65 kilograms. We know what G is. It's 9.81 newtons per kilogram. We want to find the time, but we don't know the height. The height is not 20 meters. 20 meters. I'm going to complete this diagram now. 20 meters is how far they travel this way. And if this is 25 degrees, when they travel from this point to this point, and by the way, they don't run off the edge of a ramp. This continues. Right? Nate, we can find the height using basic trigonometry. And since that height is across or opposite from the angle, I can use sine of theta 
sine of 25 degrees equals the opposite side, which is the height, over the hypotenuse, which is 20. That h that I've written a couple times there is not the hypotenuse, it's the height. So the height will be 20 sine 25 degrees. That's pretty basic math. I get 8.45. So we have a height of 8.45 meters. That, of course, is going to go here. And now we can cross multiply. See, this is kind of what I mean when I've said before many times. The units might just get in the way of looking at what to do. Because when I say cross multiply, I immediately saw this S on the bottom. It's got nothing to do with anything. So if you are confused by that, once again, and I've said this many times, I'm more interested in your ability to get the answer. I'm not sure why I erased the T. T is not a unit, it's a variable. I'm more interested in your ability to get the answer. So you know, you know on a written response assignment you have to show the units, but if that's the case, write it down with the units and then on scrap paper write it down without the units and do it that way. Uh, I'm going to have to cross multiply. I'll get 1.9 times 10 to the 3, 1900 times t equals all this other stuff. So t will be equal to all this other stuff multiplied together divided by 1900. It was 65 kilograms, wasn't it? Yes. Okay. Times 9.81 times our answer, which is the height, divided by that power of 1900, gives us 2.83, or 2.84, I should say, seconds, and that's the answer. Okay. All right. We have three days for review. The first part of today's review is going to be just me going over. I have to clean up some things here from a different class. Going over the review with you. And then for the second part of today, I'm going to assign, or not assign, I'm going to give you a list of suggested textbook problems to practice. And then tomorrow, I'm going to give you some multiple choice and numerical response questions that we will work on together tomorrow and Friday. And then your exam is Monday. Monday exams are risky. If you leave school Friday and you go, oh, well, I got all weekend to study. You know what that turns into sometimes. You wake up Saturday and go, oh, well, I got all of Sunday to study. And then next thing you know, you're crawling into bed Sunday evening and you have that terrifying awakening where you go, oh no, I have an exam tomorrow. Don't be that person. Okay? You have lots of time between now and Monday to prepare for your exam, but that doesn't mean you have lots of time to put it off. You should be doing some physics. You're welcome. Every day. All right, I do not want to spend a whole boatload of time on this. But I do think it's important, given that the units in high school physics are quite large, you may have even forgotten what was in this unit. Where did we start? And we started off with circular motion in terms of just describing circular motion. And what do I mean by just describing circular motion? What I'm talking about here is understanding some very basic formulas regarding circular motion. That since you have an object moving in a circle, you could always take the circumference of the circle, which is 2 pi r, and divide by the time it takes to go around once, which is called the period. Now this formula is on your formula sheet. It appears with a c here, which means circular or centripetal, 
And I'll get to the centripetal aspect in a second, but let's just stick with circular. In this formula, T is called the period of revolution. And I'm not going to write this down. You can add more to this if you feel the need to. The period of revolution is how long it takes whatever is moving to move in one complete circle. So if I have an album that's on a turntable and it's rotating in such a way that it takes 1.83 seconds to rotate one full revolution, then the period is 1.83 seconds. Okay. However, we also introduced the concept of frequency. of revolution. And there's a relationship between the period of revolution and the frequency of revolution. The period of revolution is how long it takes to go around once, whereas the frequency is the reciprocal of that. It's how many times it goes around in one second. So this is measured in seconds. This is measured in hertz, which means per second. So when I, when I say the frequency of something, I'll pick a hummingbird. The frequency of the wing flap of a hummingbird might be 200 hertz. That just means 200 times per second. The frequency of a gyroscope might be 25 hertz, which means that the gyroscope is making 25 complete revolutions per second. So frequency can mean things other than circular motion, but in terms of circular motion, what it really means is the number of revs per second. But we don't write the unit revs per second. We just say hertz, which means per second. Although we don't explain in this course where this comes from, well, let's back up a bit here. If I have an object moving with a constant speed, which is what we usually deal with, it's called uniform circular motion. If I have an object moving with a constant speed in a circle, who's willing to explain to me why the object is accelerating even though it's moving at a constant speed? Alex? What's a vector? Acceleration. Right. We had a nice conversation in Physics 30 a couple of days ago about pronouns. Pronouns in terms of words like acceleration or velocity. The word it is an understanding killer in science. Oh, explain why something happens. Well, it did this and then it did that. We need to be specific. So what is a vector? Let me repeat the question because I took you off track there. I apologize. The question is why is there an acceleration even though the object is not speeding up? Uh, vectors include like uh, speed and like direction. Right. So the velocity of an object, which is what we use to decide whether there's an acceleration, includes how, how fast and in what direction. So since moving in a circle means the direction of the object is changing, the velocity is changing. If the velocity is changing, there's an acceleration. The magnitude of the acceleration can be found by taking v squared over r, or, and we didn't really, I kind of hand waved away where most of these formulas came from because it's not that important. Or the acceleration can be equal to 4 pi squared r over t squared. Can somebody who's got a formula sheet handy look and see if I got that right? I'm pretty sure I did. Okay. The only other thing I can add to this, and this may not match that first lesson perfectly, I'm, but we will cover all the material. 
The only other thing I can add is sometimes you're given frequencies that are revs per minute, and you need to be able to work with that. You know, if I told you that uh, a record was moving at 45 revs per minute, you could take 45 divided by 60 and get how many revs per second, and then you could find the period from that because that would be the frequency. So hertz is revs per second. It's not revs per minute. In terms of Newton's second law of motion, in terms of Newton's second law of motion, if there's an acceleration, then there has to be a force, a net force acting on the object. I'm just going to locate the center of my circle here. Don't draw in these lines. I'm just locating where the center is. So if I have an object on a string, and the object is attached to a string and I'm twirling it in a circle, at a constant speed, it doesn't matter what the object is. The object can be some ball of some sort. So there's the ball. And I'm twirling it. It doesn't matter whether I move it clockwise or counterclockwise. That very end of that string in the center is fixed in place, and I'm twirling it. If it's moving at a constant speed, then we know that the velocity is changing because the direction is changing. There are some directions you need to be familiar with on this diagram. First of all, the direction of the force on that ball has to be towards the center. So this is the force acting on the ball. And we can quibble and call it the net force or the centripetal force or the applied force. I'm not worried about that right now. The direction that this ball is moving at any particular point in time will always be perpendicular to the orbit. So this is the direction of the velocity. There's a reason why the velocity has to be perpendicular to the radius. And I, I may have just misspoken a minute ago, so let me clear that up potentially. I may have just said the velocity is perpendicular to the orbit. That is not what I meant to say. The velocity is perpendicular to the radius, and the velocity is tangent to the orbit. The velocity is not perpendicular to the orbit. That's just a nonsensical statement. I don't even know what that means. The reason why the velocity and the force have to be perpendicular is because if, and this is going to seem really weird because you know the force is in, but if the force was even a little bit in that direction, there is a small component of that force that's in the same direction as the motion of the object. So the object would speed up. If the force acting on the object were in that direction, then there is a component of that force that's acting in the opposite direction to the direction of the motion, so the object would slow down. The only way you can apply a continual force to an object and not be contributing to its speed or taking away from its speed is if that force you're applying is at right angles to the motion. And by the way, now we can get to the heart of the matter and say that this is the net force. Now, this is tricky. Conceptually, it's pretty greasy. It's the net force, but it might be a force of friction. It might be a force of gravity. It might be an applied force. It might be an applied force and a force of friction. It could be, in physics 30, an electric force and a magnetic force. But the net result is the object goes in a circle. So it's the net force. It's the sum of all of the forces.
A force of friction is a type of force. A force of gravity is a type of force. A magnetic force is a type of force. A centripetal force is not a type of force. A centripetal force is a result. And it's the net force. So one of the most important things about this is that the net force for uniform circular motion is the centripetal force. And all I mean is it's just that's what it's called. This is not two different forces. They're the same force. And that leads us finally to the acceleration. Well, if F net <coughs> equals MA, and I'm going to dispense with the vectors here. Well, maybe I shouldn't. If F net equals MA, we have learned that the acceleration will always be in the direction of the net force. And that means that the acceleration of this is also towards the center. The acceleration of this is also towards the center. And I've used three different colors here because you can't start adding these vectors together. They're different things. You know, it's, it's not even apples and oranges. It's apples, oranges, and pizzas. It's just three different things. But what this means, and now I'm going to drop the vector symbols in a second, is that the net force for uniform circular motion is m times the centripetal acceleration. And that means F net equals m times v squared over r, or f net has a magnitude of m times 4 pi squared r over t squared. And if you're wondering how that happened, it's because the acceleration, the acceleration is v squared over r, or 4 pi squared r over t squared. I mean, just look up to the top of the page that you're writing on. What I'm putting here, just so you know, what I'm putting here, I'm putting in the second box. I see that some of you are putting it all in the first box, and that's fine. But I don't want you, when I go to the next page, to think I skipped something. This is circular motion and Newton's, and Newton's second law of motion. It's the second box. So if you put it all in the first box, that's fine. Just leave the second one empty. This is the gist of it, the essence. OK, we're going to pick up the pace a bit here. Circular motion, friction, and horizontal circular motion. I could have called this Newton's second law and friction. There's one application you need to be familiar with, and it's for vehicles navigating a curve. When I say a curve, I mean a circular curve. The Analysis of a curve that's in the shape of a parabola or an ellipse or things like that is beyond the scope of this course. You can't handle it because the math is too complicated. Circles are nice, tidy shapes that have curves in them. So for vehicles navigating a curve, the net force which produces the circular motion The net force which produces the circular motion, the net force which is the centripetal force, that 
is provided by the force of friction between the tires and the road. That's what causes a car to move along the curve on the highway. And incidentally, these curves that we analyze in Physics 20 are horizontal curves. They're not banked. When you engineer highways, you usually bank the highway a couple of degrees at least, and that increases the amount of friction, which increases how fast you can go. But we don't get into that. So this is the force of friction between the tires and the road. How does this help us analyze questions like, well, how fast can this truck go around a curve? Well, this is MA. Force of friction is mu Fn. I'm just going off the formula sheet. F net equals MA. That's a formula on your formula sheet. Force of friction, mu Fn. This becomes centripetal acceleration, which means you have MV squared over R. This becomes mu times the force of gravity. Why is it, we've, man, we've asked this question dozens of times. Why is the normal force the force of gravity in this situation? Yeah? A little louder? It's on a horizontal surface, and the forces vertically have to be balanced, so the normal force, which is perpendicular upwards, has to equal the magnitude of the force of gravity, which is perpendicular downward. Where does that lead us? It leads us to m v squared over r equals mu times m times g. And you can use this for whatever your heart desires. You can calculate the maximum speed if you know the coefficient of friction. You can find the radius given the right circumstances. Do the masses cancel? Yes or yes? yes? Yes, they do. So on an exam, typically you might see one question where you're given the mass of an object, and that means you can put it in, but you almost always see another question where you're not given the mass, and I know what happens when students write the exam. Some hands start going up, and I go over, I go, what's the problem? I go, oh, you didn't tell us the mass. And I'll go, yeah, you're right, I didn't tell you the mass. Because you should know they cancel. I won't, I won't tell the student that at the time, but you should know ahead of time. Another application, artificial gravity and g-forces. Without getting into too much detail, since the acceleration is the acceleration towards the center of curvature, if you were on the inside of a drum that's spinning, you will feel a force pushing you to the inside. And that force is called an artificial force of gravity if you stand up in the drum. Or it can be called a g-force if you're standing up or sitting down. It doesn't matter. The bottom line here is you equate the artificial force to the centripetal force. And it occurs to me, I, I didn't mention earlier, it's called centripetal acceleration and centripetal force because centripetal means center seeking. W what do I mean? Equate this. Well, what you're going to do is you're going to equate the perceived force to the centripetal force, which is the net force. What does that mean? Well, the net force is MA, and it's centripetal, right? And that means that we can write M V squared over R. How many of you have realized, I'm going to go back and just show this to you quickly, that when I said acceleration, is either v squared over r or 4 pi squared r over t squared. We almost always use v squared over r. Okay. 
we would use v squared over r in this circumstance. And essentially now, I don't really want to write much else. I'm going to put f perceived here. If you had a problem where you wanted to experience one g-force, then you would put this. This would be for one g-force, one force of gravity. If I said to you that during astronaut training, a particular astronaut, she experiences six g-forces, then you would set it up this way. You would say 6 mg equals mv squared over r. By the way, can you cancel the masses in any of these? Sure. Now, you may be given questions where you don't want to find the speed, but you might want to find the frequency or the period. You still have these formulas, v equals 2 pi r over t, and frequency equals the reciprocal of period, right? I mean, if I said to you, how many seconds does it take the, orbit, the Earth orbiting satellite to spin once on its axis, which is the period, then you could use, for 1g, you could use this statement here to find the speed of rotation, and then you could equate that to 2 pi r over t to get the period. Is this all starting to come back to you? Slowly. Okay. Vertical circular motion. <laughs> I'm going to attempt to explain this first without diagrams. If you're trying to rotate an object that's attached to a string through a vertical circle at a constant speed, where do you have to pull harder in that task? Jay? At the bottom. And the reason is gravity is pulling that object towards the floor, and you're trying to pull it upwards, so gravity is fighting you. You're fighting gravity. You have to apply a greater force. That means that at the bottom, the applied force is equal to the necessary net force plus something else. Plus what? Plus the magnitude of the force of gravity. I have to apply a certain force just to get that mv squared over r happening, but then I got to apply more because that force that I'm going to apply is being diminished by gravity. So I have to add more to make it work. At the top, I need to get that mv squared over r happening, but at the top, the force of gravity is acting in the direction that I'm pulling in, so I don't have to pull as hard. I'm going to leave that explanation there without diagrams. If you want, you can certainly go back in your notes and look at the diagrams on how they were developed, how we developed these equations. That's what's important. Um, you know, this is MA. I don't know if you want to write this or not. This is MG. This is sometimes called the tension if you're pulling on a rope. Can I cancel the masses? No, I cannot because there's no mass on the left-hand side. And then you can go further and write MV squared over R because A is V squared over R. You know, same thing here. The tension, if it's tension, you can use the word tension. Well, use whatever you want as long as you understand it's the applied force. 
this will be m times the centripetal acceleration. This will be m times g. There is one other question that you are sometimes asked about, and it's an application of this, which is, what's the minimum speed to make it through the top? And if you make it through the top, well, first of all, if the system collapses, it'll happen at the top, won't it? If I'm swinging that glass of water that I did in a vertical circular motion and I don't go fast enough, I'm more likely to get wet when it's at the top. So when it's at the top, if I'm just making it around the top, that means that the tension is just zero. In other words, at the top, at the minimum speed, gravity is doing the job for me. So when you're talking about a minimum speed for a successful orbit, that corresponds to the net force being the force of gravity. There's no tension at all. And if you go up here and look at this equation, and I change tension to zero, or this equation, and I change the applied force to zero, then I have F net minus FG equals zero, so F net equals FG. The next one you have, I believe, is called satellite motion. You have another one that says circular motion on Newton's second law. Is that right? We've already done that. So the next one I want you to look at is satellite motion. And I think on the next page you have one that says satellite motion. Um, look, if, if I wanted to be a little bit lazy about this, I could just write this. We're talking here about satellites that are moving in a circular orbit, though. So to go a little bit further in our analysis, this is mass times acceleration, which is centripetal. Why, and there's at least one person in the room who, who might not agree with this, and technically they're right. But why should we not write this? Because its strength strength is not on the vertical field. Right. The gravitational field strength where a satellite is is not known to you. Now, you could certainly calculate it, but I think then you're overcomplicating things. How would we calculate Fg here, or what would we write for Fg then? Right. Oh, wait. No, that's, uh... no that's, that's right. Yeah, that's right. The force due to gravity between the satellite and the Earth is between the satellite and the Earth is capital G times the mass of the satellite times the mass of the Earth over. This is not the radius of the Earth. It's the radius of the satellite's orbit. We can clearly cancel a mass. Which object's mass? cancels. Nate? No, it's not the Earth. It's the satellite. Because think of it this way. This acceleration here that's with the m, m times the acceleration, what's accelerating? Is it the Earth accelerating? No. It's the satellite undergoing a circular acceleration or centripetal. So it's the mass of the satellite that cancels. I'll cancel that in a second. You can then say mv squared over r equals g m m over r squared. Cancel the mass of the satellite. And I mean, you can also cancel an r from both sides of the equation. So to go one step further, we could say v squared equals g m over r. And then, well, That equation is something which you can use to your heart's desire. If you want to find the speed of the satellite, go ahead and find the speed of the satellite. If you want to find the orbital radius, 
go ahead and find the orbital radius. I'm stalling here, hoping that my computer catches up. While I'm waiting, there it is, remember that if this is the Earth and this is the satellite, that this entire distance is R in that formula, which means it's a sum of the radius of the Earth and the altitude of the satellite above the Earth. And you have to be able to you know, work in both directions there. Maybe I give you the altitude and I ask you to find the speed. Then you have to add that altitude to the radius of the Earth or the planet to get R. Maybe I've given you a question where I'm asking you to find the altitude and out of this formula here pops the radius of orbit. Well, then you have to take away from the radius of orbit the radius of the Earth in order to get the altitude. My recommendation is if you ever want to find the period of an orbit, of an, of an orbiting satellite, and this is in that assignment you did, then find the speed first at which point in time you can use speed equals 2 pi r over t. I think putting in for a 4 pi squared m, 4 pi squared r over t squared gets messy. You end up getting an equation with r cubed and t squared in it. There's one example we did in class where you need to do that, but that was just to learn about the next thing I want to mention, and I'll just mention it. You need to know that a geostationary satellite has an orbit with a period exactly equal to the rate of rotation of the planet. Geostationary satellites are always above the same point in the sky, which means they rotate in a circular orbit at the same rate that the planet is spinning. <coughs> and then work and energy. So that's circular motion. All of that is circular motion, work and energy. Well, I think you need to understand that work is a change in energy, but you need to understand how to calculate work. And there are some things about this formula, work equals FD, that you need to know. Force is a vector, displacement is a vector, but work and energy are scalars. However, <laughs> this is weird. Force and displacement are both vectors, but when you multiply them, you get a scalar. But when you multiply them, you have to take the direction into account, even though we're not going to get a vector. Both of these quantities have to be in the same direction or opposite directions. which means that if you're pulling a wagon across a floor by attaching a rope to it and pulling it at some angle that's not horizontal, you need to take the force that you apply and use it to find a component of the force that's in the direction the wagon moves. And you can look back in your examples for that. This is the way I prefer this formula. Of course, on your formula sheet, I think it's something like this. That's going to be quite confusing to you because I didn't really teach that in detail. And the reason I didn't is that whenever I do, it's just confusing anyway. If you can handle that formula, you just need to remember that theta is the angle between the force and the displacement. That's really what it boils down to. The other thing I will just point out to you, though, is if you're asked to find work, this might be preferable.
a perfect illustration of this, and there's no need to write this down. I'm just going to put it on the sideboard so you can see what I'm talking about. A perfect illustration of this is that 1,600 kilogram Mustang we were talking about going from 0 meters per second to 28 meters per second in 5.92 seconds. If I said how much work is done and you want to use force times displacement, then you need to find the acceleration using kinematics and then use F net equals MA to find the net force. You also need to use kinematics to find the displacement. So now you're at three calculations and then you have to multiply the displacement and the net force. Whereas if I say how much work is done and you go, oh, well, it's the change in kinetic energy, you just have to go one half mv squared and you're done. There's nothing to it. I, I put this here just to remind you of the formulas. I don't really have much to say, but sometimes you need to, in the course of a problem, calculate a gravitational potential energy. That's the formula that you use. So this is gravitational potential. I was a little rushed this morning, I guess, when I typed this up. I certainly don't mean to imply that gravitational is a type of kinetic energy here. That should really say gravitational potential, comma, and kinetic energies. So this is gravitational potential energy, and this is kinetic energy. So, you know, I, I, you're not going to be giving questions on a physics 20 exam. Find the kinetic energy of a 12 kilogram mass moving at 4 meters per second. But you might, look at the Mustang example again on the sideboard, you might need to use that to make a more difficult problem simpler. I don't really have anything to say here. This is science 9, science 10. Uh, Hooke's law and elastic potential energy. Hooke's law is F equals KX. One of the only reasons we learned that, and I know it's more complicated than that on your formula sheet, one of the only reasons we talked about that in this unit is it led us to this. Which is what you need to know how to work with. So if I say to you, what is the work done in compressing a spring? You can just say, well, I'm going to find the potential energy gained by the spring, and that's the work done. In Unit 4, when we talk about something called simple harmonic motion, we will deal with Hooke's Law even more. And then we're down to the end, conservation of mechanical energy. This is what the Law of Conservation of Mechanical Energy says. Mechanical energy is the sum of potential and kinetic energy at any point in time. I mean, you, you take a mental snapshot of the system at that point in time, add up all of its potential and kinetic energies. Could that potential energy be gravitational? Yeah. Could it be spring or elastic? Sure. What are the two conditions necessary for you to say mechanical energy is conserved? There's two things that have to be true. What's one, Alex? Um, which one? That there is no friction present. There are no forces of friction. Producing what? Sorry for the interruption. Just to let you know, can the junior uh, varsity girls also go to or this is order No force of friction producing what? Heat energy, right?
There's something else, though. You can have a system where there's no force of friction, which results in heat energy, which, which bleeds mechanical energy out of the system. You can have no friction, but you can still not have mechanical energy conserved. What's the other thing? Uh, no additional work done. Right, no additional work is done. No work is done, which means nobody has added energy to the system or taken energy away from the system by pushing it against its motion. Like if the, box, if the car is moving to the right, even though there's no friction, if I'm pushing the car backwards physically, I'm doing work in a negative manner. So no work is done. And this should really start to go full circle and make sense because work is a change in energy. So if no work is done, you're not changing the energy in the system. There's a myriad, well not a myriad, there's lots of different problems that you can apply this to. What if there is heat produced? Well, I can still say the initial energy equals the final energy. I just can't say initial mechanical equals final mechanical. But I could write this, E mechanical before equals E mechanical after plus the heat that was bled out of the system. So if, if you have, I'll just throw some numbers down, don't write these down. If I had 100 joules of mechanical energy before and I only had 90 joules of mechanical energy afterwards, mechanical energy isn't conserved. But the total energy is because that would mean I would have 10 joules of heat as an illustration. The other thing, of course, is I've made a big deal, everybody, of, I hope, impressing on you that heat is energy but friction is a force. But they're connected because the greater the force of friction, the more heat you're going to produce. I think that makes sense. How do you calculate heat? This is not on your formula sheet, but you need to know. Do you remember Aoki? Excellent. Force of friction times the displacement. Really, this is just work done by friction. I, I don't really like that phrase, work done by friction, but I guess it is technically the work done by the force of friction. So the work done by a monkey is the force that the monkey applies multiplied by the displacement of the object. The force of friction times the displacement would be the work done by friction. So you may need to employ that. And finally, two things. Um, I'm missing something here. So if, if you go back to that box that we didn't use, or you can write it below the power if you like, I am missing the work energy theorem. Okay, so we've said if no work is done and no frictional forces exist, so no heat is produced, mechanical energy is conserved. We've said if there is a force of friction which produces heat, then we do this. If work is done, so this is if work is done, then you use the work energy theorem. Which says the work is the final energy minus the initial energy. And man, you know, there's, there's a boatload of different things that can happen here. And, and I don't know, if you want to write this next part down, you have to think carefully about how you're going to do it. This might be given, or it might be found using the applied force times the displacement. Right? This could be MGH. 
It could also include one half kx squared. It could also include one half mv squared. I mean, I don't think I'd give you a problem where all three energies were there to begin with. But two of them could be. This could be mgh. It could be one half kx squared. It could be one half mv squared. And it could be one other one. What could the fourth type of energy be here? Yeah, it could be heat. Because I could make things more complicated by saying, you know what, somebody's doing work and there's friction involved. And heat is always a final, just want to move this. Heat is always a final type of energy. I mean, it's bled out of the system throughout the whole trip, but it's accounted for at the end. This is kind of what I suspected would happen. We're just going to go right to the bell here. But we have three days, so this is good that I, we put three days here. There's a lot to review. Power. Well, power equals change in energy over time or equals work over time. That change in energy is final minus initial. And guess what? That could be kinetic. It could be potential. It could be spring potential energy. It could be all kinds of things. Make sure you know how to work with that formula. Make sure you know that the units are important. The units of power are joules per second or watts. As much as I tell you, think joules per second, you will see on exams W for watts. And then, of course, percent efficiency. Which is equal to useful over total times 100. I do not give you this formula. You can use useful energy over total energy times 100. You could use useful power over total power times 100. Your call, but be consistent. Don't go joules over watts or watts over joules. And that's it, my friends. Um, if you are chomping at the bit, as they say, on page 336 of your textbook, questions 29 to 47 are a whole series of problems. If you just don't want to let your brain get atrophied between today and tomorrow, you might want to just try a few of these problems for tomorrow. I am sure as well you have many problems in your unit handout that either were not assigned or, I know this would be rare, but or maybe some of you didn't get all of them done the first time around. I would highly recommend doing some physics tonight. Tomorrow I'm going to have a handout with some exam style questions. I think I have about 60 multiple choice numerical response that you can practice. Have a wonderful day. Did the bell ring already? Okay, I apologize for that.